Good afternoon and welcome to at-risk training. Um, this is just for those of you that are on the at-risk program. Um, some people refer to it as a supper or a third meal, but it really is called at-risk. I don't know how, I think we kind of know how that term got started, but really we're going to call this at-risk because that's what this is. Um, Sherry sent out yesterday the slides and um, some handouts. If you did not get a copy of that, we do keep those in the resource library. So at any time you can go and get copies of that. We're gonna keep them out there indefinitely. Um, so we, and I'm trying to think, because this year we did things a little bit different than in the past. So August, September and October, and technically some in November, we had all day trainings and then now we split up all the trainings. So we have at risk this is more like the administrative side Then we have meal patterns that will be next uh, it's in two weeks. It's the second Tuesday of the month. Then we have, if you are a regular daycare center, we have um, admin and purchasing. And then we do at risk every month along with um, multi-sided. And um, if you have infants, we do infants every other month and then food buying guide every other month. And these are smaller trainings. We kind of break it up a little bit. So I'm just trying to give you an FYI. So if you don't, if you so we used to, when we had the big training, the old age or the four hour training for at risk, it's shortened because we took out the meal pattern stuff since that's its own training. Um, again, those slides are out in the resource library and it is under um, training slides and handouts. So if you didn't get them, you can go out there at any time. They're going to stay up there until I think August or September of next year. Um, but again, we are going to go over this book mostly. This is the at risk guidance manual. We sent a copy of this to everybody who is on at risk. Um, if you didn't get a copy of it, this is also found in the resource library under the at risk section. And then we also sent everybody who does at risk a manual. It's an at risk manual. If you're a regular daycare, we sent you a regular daycare manual and the at risk if you do both programs. So just to kind of give you a heads up of what you should be, you should have received. Um, I'm going to quickly just see who my audience is today. And um, if you could let me know, this is just helps me know what to cover, what not to cover, who to gear it towards. But if you could take the poll, that would be great. Okay, this just gives me an idea. So we have a couple of school districts on here and then we have um, just some nonprofits that just do at risk. So thank you so much for taking that. That lets me kind of know what I need to go with this training. Okay, so again, we're gonna be talking about this book a lot right here, the guidance manual. Um, again, this is in other documents for schools. You can find it there as well, but it's also in the resource library for CACFP. There's going to be some page numbers on the slides. If the page number starts with an ATR, it's in this at-risk guide. If it starts with an A, it is in the CACFP at-risk training manual. So just to give you an idea, so if you ever want to reference anything, you can go back into the book and look. Um, again, most of it is going to be in this manual. They're going to be in both, but I tried to emphasize this one because this one did come from USDA. So we kind of did a little name change this past week or so. And I see my slides a little bit messed up, but we used to call our child nutrition, those in the field as consultants, and really they're not a consultant. Um, they're, we're, we're changing their title because people didn't understand when you say consultant, and that's really somebody who you pay independently to come out and help you do things. And we don't charge for our services because we're, we administer the program. So they are now called a child nutrition program specialist. So I'll refer to them as a program specialist or as a specialist. And that is your 
was your consultant. So I'm trying to get in the habit of saying it. I did a training yesterday and I kept on saying consultant. So, um, but just know that if you wanna get to know your program specialist, the one that comes out and does your review, their information is on page A6 of the at-risk training manual. Um, those numbers in there and email addresses, you can contact them at any time. The phone number in there is a cell phone. So you can also text them. You can call email, however you choose to get a hold of them. But that information is on page A6 in this training manual. You can call them anytime for technical assistance. What that means is if you're not aware of the program or you don't know if you're doing things correctly, you can call them and they can come out and take a look at stuff or talk to you about it. Um, they just cannot, if they're going to come out to do a review, they can't turn that into technical assistance. They have to do the review. But you can call them and be like, hey, and if we find stuff, we don't like write it down and what we saw and like ding you for it. It's just we're trying to help you get on the right track. Um, if you do have any other questions, you can contact our office. Like right now, we are going through doing some application approvals. Um, the office handles the claiming aspect, um, application approvals, that kind of thing. And your consult or your program specialist is the one that comes out and does your review. And everything that we're talking about, they're the ones who are very knowledgeable about it. There are some of us, like myself, um, that we've been in the field for a long time. So we do understand the, the front of the program. And, um, but a lot of people here in the office don't. So that's why we say, if you have questions regarding the program, um, you may want to contact your consultant, like if you're doing things correctly, the paperwork and that kind of type thing, but the back end stuff, like your um, DUNS number, all that kind of stuff is always handled here in the office. And if you have anybody's name, you can always email anybody at the State Department. And our email address at the State Department is first name dot or a period last name at sde.ok.gov. Um, again, those for your consultant, it is listed in here. But like if you if you want to email me, again, my email address is Kendra.Murvell. If you see my little video, my name is on there and it's just my first name period, last name at sde.ok.gov. So you can contact us at any time if you need anything. So just because we do have some schools on here, our federal fiscal year is October 1st to September 30th. That is why we are doing applications when we do them in September, because that is our fiscal year starts in October. Um, we do administer both school, like the school lunch program, but we also administer daycares. But the federal fiscal year is October 1st. With the school program, we are allowed to have our fiscal year be July 1 to June 30th because that is a nat that's kind of like a national fiscal year for schools. So um, we can do a lot of things in July for schools, but um, really for child nutrition in general, everything that we do is really October 1st to September 30th is our federal fiscal year. So if you were on the program last year and you're coming and you're renewing your application, your contract with us, we need your paperwork from October until September 30th. That is one year. So if you're a school and you're out for the summer and you came back in August, so August, September, that is last fiscal year. Starting October 1st, it goes into the new fiscal year um, for at risk. Now this website right here that's posted, this is the website that gets to our system. Um, our system, this is where you go to do the application and agreement. This is where you can go to get access to the training calendar. And again, if you saw the slide when you first began, um, you do have to be registered in the training calendar. And I think most of you all were um, to get access to, to um, get credit for this class. We do not send out certificates. Um, we take the Zoom information and we take the information in the training calendar and it will show up and I'll, I'll talk about that more. And this is also where you go to have access to your claims. But that all everything there on the left hand side, that is all you all, you have to log in to have access. Now, where you see the resource library, you do not have to log in to have access, but the things that can be found in, in the resource library are USDA memos. We have our training manuals there. We have saved this book there, slides, handouts, the food buying guide. We have our interactive forms. Um, so we have all of our information that you might need to do our program. It, you name it, it's gonna be out there for sure. Um, and a lot of things that if we do email, it's also gonna be located in the resource library. And if you are a school and say you're new to this, it's the same thing as other documents, but on the CACFB side, we call it the resource library. So it's the same thing if you're used to other documents. Now the online application and agreement, 
Um, a lot of you either have already filled it out and you've submitted it to us, or you're in the process of doing that now. Now, just a reminder throughout the year, you do need to make any updates as they, as they occur. Um, the thing is, is that's what we use. So if we are coming out to look at meal times, if we're doing a review, we're going to go by everything that's in your system, in that system that you put in there. And if we come out and you're not doing what you said you would, that's a finding on the review. So anytime you do or change anything that, from what's on your application agreement, um, make sure you go in there and update it. Now, again, we have some schools on here. And the school side and the CECFP side, they look alike, but they, they are very different. You can go in at any time and make changes to your application. Um, a lot of times what it's going to do is what I would tell you to do is once you make a change, email the office to let us know that you made this change and we can go in there and approve it. On the school side, um, we have locks and once it's green locked or once it's gold locked, we have to unlock it for you to go in and change it. So it's different. You can go in there at any time and change anything um, with the CACFP side. There's just a couple of things that you can't change, but it will flag you and let you know, or we'll talk about it here today. If you are contracting for food, if you meaning like every day somebody comes in and brings you food, it's already cooked. Um, all you're doing is say like today they brought you spaghetti, you serve it out, and then tomorrow they're bringing you chicken nuggets and you serve it out. That's what we talk about with CACFP about food service. If you're a food service management company, that's different. We already have a copy of that contract. But if you have a if, if you get food every day from an entity, and a lot of our daycare stuff would get them from a school district, then we do have to have a copy of that, um, that contract every single year. If you contract for any services, um, it must have a contract that is approved by us before you can go out on bid. So you have to write a contract, bring it to us, say, hey, can I do this? Like, say you want to hire an accountant to help with C. It's only what you would use for CACFP. Um, then we would look at that, approve it or not approve it. And then after we do approve it, then you can go out on bid. Now, you, your application for this year, if you did not submit it by October 31st, you will not get to claim for October. If you submitted it in November, which today's December 1st, so if you still haven't submitted it, if you just, if you, the date that you originally submit your application is the month that you can start claiming, even for renewal. We can't backdate. So if you submit originally, like you, it took you a couple of months, you're filling out your application and you submitted it today, we cannot go back to October and let you claim meals because you did not have an application that you submitted to our office. Now, it, there could be something where you submitted it in October, but we're still needing information from you and you're getting that, we understand. But if you originally submit it, say today, we cannot backdate your application and pay you for August or for um, October, uh, September, if you just submitted it in December. So whatever month you originally submit your application to us is the month that you can claim for. We do have some required forms for application changes. And this, a lot of this is after the renewal time. So if you, after your renewal and after say your application is completely approved today, um, then if you have to change anything with your meal services, like change your times, maybe how many kids, then you do have to do a meal service change form in order to do that. If you are multi-sided or if you want to add or remove a site to your um, agreement, then we have to have a form for that. And then the certificate of authority, it's if you want anybody to have a password and a username for CACFP. And we do have to have a certificate of authority um, for that person. So, and that is actually found in the resource library. The other ones are, um, are found in the manual and in the resource library. If you're not familiar, the website that I was talking about, this is what it looks like once you either copy and paste it or you type that in. This is, again, what it looks like. Now, again, if you're a school district, I just kind of caution you because they look alike. The school system, the car system, and CACFP look just alike. We get calls all the time saying, I can't get in. And it's because they're on the wrong website. So there's two things where you can go to find out that you're in the right one. Is right here. It says Child and Adult Care Food Program, CACFP. The other one is if you come over to this column and you see the resource library. Resource library is CACFP. 
other documents is the car system for the school side. If you do go into the resource library, again, you do not have to log in and have access. This is where we keep all of our information, um, all of our handouts, all of our forms. And as you can see here, we even have a whole at-risk program resource. Uh, we did have to break this book up into several sections. You can see it has part one through six. It's because this book is not very thick, but it's very colorful and it took up a lot of space. So that's why we have a link. So you can either copy that link and pull up the whole PDF or you can do it by section. Again, it's not that thick. It's not that thick of a book. It's just it's very, very colorful. So it took up a lot of space, which is a little bit annoying. On the business maintenance page, once you log in, you'll have what's called the business maintenance page. This did change if you've been on the program before this changed in September, after, or I think October. It changed after we came out with the new application. So before it said, um, contact information for CACFP contact. Now it does, we have owner, executive director, or superintendent that goes right here. And then we have authorized users. You can have multiple authorized representatives. You can have somebody just have a use in, username and login just so they can get to the training calendar. They can see things, but they can't touch anything. It's called read only. So, but you can give people access to the application side, to the claim side, or to both. But again, this done here, you can, I believe, update the authorized rep, but the owner, executive director, and superintendent, we are the only ones in the office that can update that information. If you scroll down even further below that, you're going to see this information right here. And this right here, the big thing in the big red circle is this tells you who your office staff is. This person is assigned to your application agreement from now until if they leave, um, like in years. So they're the person that you can contact if you have, again, this is just an example. We have three people. We have Jennifer Pryor, Lisa King, and Karen Davis. So it, your office staff is gonna be one of those three people, but it just lets you know that you can come here and you'll know who's working on your application. Now, because it's renewal time, we've had a couple of other people that have helped with applications, but this is the person you can contact about your license, your DUNS number, any other thing that you have throughout the year, your mill change form. This is the person, if you make updates in your application agreement, you can email them to let them know that you made an update so that way they can go in and approve it. The field staff is your specialist. This is the person that comes out to do your reviews and audits. They're the, they're, that's the person that you'll find on page six. So if, if you're brand new and you go to your section and it just says Cassie Riddell, that's the only name on here. It means you're new and she hasn't assigned it yet. You haven't been assigned an office staff person or a field staff. It will not be, be that until your application is approved if you're new. And then underneath that, this is where all of the training records will go. Like I talked, we don't send out a certificate anymore. So once you attend, if you're registered, this is going to show up. And eventually we want this to have your name on it. And then we also want it eventually where you click on it and it will pull up the certificate that you can print out. But it will have like this person um, attended a training on 10-1, civil rights training. And then um, we've, we're really, we're kind of slow right now, like August, September, October, we had trainings going like crazy. We had very large trainings. Our trainings are very small. And because of the holidays, we don't have them very often um, this in the month of December. So I bet by Friday at the latest, um, Sherry will have this pulled over. If you attended and met all the requirements, uh, then you'll see, you're going to see a check mark here. If it's blank, then that means you didn't meet requirements. Now, I think we're having somewhat of a glitch that if you, um, if you if you've signed up for several trainings, you may have page numbers down here and one may show empty, but if you click another one, it may show that someone's there or maybe if you've had more multiple people sign up, um, it one got pulled over because they attended and one did not. So there's some little things right now we're just still working towards, but just to let you know where you can go to see if you attended training. This is what our this is what the people in the office will see. That's why we don't send out certificates. It's just easier for us to go on the back end do this and they can see if you've attended or not versus um, sending you an application, sending you a certificate and they have to figure out the certificates because we send a blank certificate. So, um, but we, are, we don't send out certificates anymore in CACFP. That's what we did do. So do not be looking for a certificate. Okay. 
One other thing that I want to get to right here, this is the application, this is the agreement, this is what you're agreeing to to be on CACFP. Now I know we have some school districts on here and I'm not for sure if you're new or not, but this program is very different than the school lunch program. So uh, if you are not aware of what you're agreeing to, to being on this program, this document, so when you go in here, it's number seven on the checklist. And maybe number eight now because we added something this year. But when you go in there, it makes you go to the bottom, hit next page, and then I go down and I think you hit put the date in and then hit submit. This document is 21 pages long. So if you are not sure what you're agreeing to to be on the program, I highly suggest that you do, you, you can print it as a PDF, but I would at least look at it. Um, like the number one thing on here is be financially viable, administratively capable, and have effective internal control to ensure program accountability. That has always been the number one thing in this contract. Um, it's just we're now looking at it more. Before, we didn't look at it quite like we're doing now, but that's always been the number one thing. You cannot participate in this program unless you're financially viable, capable, and accountable to be on the program. And I'm going to talk about what that is. Now, the budget. So the institution must submit a budget, and you do that in your application and agreement. This budget is when you enter this budget, it's what you project for the year. Um, it must be updated as needed. This is going to play a lot more importance next year and on because um, we're trying to get you guys used to this budget. But really, this is projected. And if you have something in your budget, we, we use your budget a lot. And we're going to have to eventually, um, I can probably kind of talk about it. I'll probably talk about more next month is we're gonna be asking for statements at the end of the year uh, that will validate your um, budget. So your budget and the information you send us kind of have to match. Um, so that's why we understand it's projected. Like right now, food prices are going up. So you may have said that you're gonna spend $10,000 on food and milk, but you may spend 20,000. So you need to go in and update stuff like that. Um, it should always again reflect what's going on at your center or your entity. Documentation may be required to approve certain items. So when you put something in your budget that you're going to say that you're paying with with CACFP, we will um, sometimes, depending on what the section is, we need. Um, I had someone they were talking about how much they were making, and I thought it sounded really high. So I asked to see documentation. So we may need documentation to validate certain things in your budget. If you're not sure how to fill out the budget, because um, we did change it then we do have how to fill out budget and BCA in the resource library. It's under the financial and the general section. It's the same thing. We just put it in two different locations. Or you can also go every month. Right now, it's been twice a month that Cassie is having a CACFP application training, and it's a walkthrough how to fill out the application. So if you want a step-by-step -step of how to fill this stuff out, we have two options. One is a YouTube. It's about a one hour. Um, or you can go to a live CACFP training that Cassie does. Okay, so now let's start talking about the basic responsibilities of at risk. Um, I'm going to talk to you about like how you get on the program, your requirements, that kind of thing. And if this is something new, this started last year. So we get audited us, our department gets audited by state auditors and by USDA. So we understand what it's like when you have people in and out of your center or your entity is again, we get audited. And this starting last year, the state auditors now require if we come out to do a review, we have to have a copy of all paperwork that we look at during that review. So it's your review month, which is the last month that you claim, and then any meal observation or days that were there. Again, this is not really from us. This is a state auditor. It does not have to be paper copies. It can be, you can scan things to us. We have a way that you can scan or if your consultant may need to help kind of help scan, but we do like, we get written up if we don't get all your paperwork. Uh, so this is something again from the state auditor. This is not from us, but it did come in handy during COVID because uh, what would happen was is you guys would send your paperwork to the consultant or to your specialist and then the specialist could do a lot of the review at, at their desk and then come out just for one day instead of being there maybe a day or being out there for a couple hours versus being out there all day or two days. So it has come in handy. And then integrity. 
So a really big part of this program, and that's why a lot of this stuff is in place, is because of USDA and integrity. Integrity is a big part of the program. On CACFP, all of our reviews are unannounced. So this has been going on now. Oh, gosh, I've been in the office three and a half years. And uh, we've been doing it for, I think, two years. So at least five years, we've been having all of our reviews unannounced. We did add in the training manual in here on page A39, we have a copy of the notification letter. You should be getting one. We just do a mass email to let you guys know. But if you need to know what we're going to look at, you can go here to the notification letter. Because I have schools on here, schools get reviewed every one, five years now. We went back to the five-year cycle. In CACFP, you cannot go more than three years without a review. So in CACFP, you may get reviewed every two to three years. If you were SD or what we call seriously deficient in the previous year, you will also get a review in the next follow-up year. So your reviews are not going to coincide with your school review if you're a school district. And as a reminder, all of your CACFP records must be readily available for review at all times. Okay? At all times. They need to be readily available. If you're not going to be there, you can always email your specialist and say, and I would tell them all the time, I'm like, hey, if you know you have a conference or vacation or, hey, you're going to be out for Christmas, just email me and let me know because I don't really want to come out there if you're not going to be there. But if you fail to tell me, then I may go. And because of our schedules, I had to get it done. So you can always email your specialist and let them know on days that you plan on not being there. Or if something happens, I did have one really good center that if things popped up, that they would kind of let me know that they weren't going to be there. So it does come in helpful. We added a new section this year to all of our manuals, and it's our financial management section. So this starts on page A11 in your training manual. Again, if it starts with an A, it's going to be in the training manual that we sent you. If it starts with ATR, it's going to be in this manual. So I talked about how you have to be um, financially viable, capable, and accountable to be on the program. Well, what does that mean? So all institutions, again, must be what we call BCA. So financial viable, what that means is it means you have adequate financial resources to operate on a daily basis in case there are any interruptions in pay. The purpose of this program. So I'm going to give you the real purpose of this program because people just think it's feeding kids. That's not the intent of this program. This specific, specific program, CECFP is even, it's, it's, it is to feed kids, but it's not just that we've given you money to feed kids. The intent of this program is you have to be in a low income area to, to be able to be on the at risk. And the intent of this program is for you to feed more nutritious meals. But really the whole point is this is an after school care program that has an enrichment or educational component to it. So you are providing a safe place for lower income kids to go and get education, enrichment, at a safe place and you are able to serve a meal. That is the purpose of this program. So we're just giving you extra funds so your meals can be more nutritious, but you, if we, and what's happened before, the government I think is about to shut down again tomorrow is the last, on the third, so two days on Friday. Um, it could possibly shut down again. And it has happened before when the government shuts down, I think that's when our funds always go through is December. There could be a chance that we can't pay out. And even with COVID, we had it to where um, for a little while we were only getting funds right at the time and it would only cover so much. So it's, we cannot help this stuff. We deal with Washington, D.C. So again, um, you should have enough finances that if we can't pay you, you're not calling us being like, I need my money. You have to also be capable. You have to have enough staff to be able to stay in compliance and to be able to run the program. The other aspect of this is to be accountable. You have to have program oversight. You have to be able to do the training, the monitoring, or anything else that this program does require. VCA, so VCA has, again, always been a part of the application and agreement, but we're really monitoring it now. We have to. So this year on the application and agreement, if it's not your first year, we did add VCA questions. If you are brand new coming on to any CACFP program, you are required to fill out what we call a VCA. We cannot approve your application without the VCA document. 
and the VCA documents about 12 pages long and you have to send in um, bank statements, you have to send us financial records. We have to make sure that if there are any interruptions in pay that you can handle it, that you're not just waiting for our funds. We are always going to be looking at BCA from here. As long as you're on um, child nutrition, we're going to be looking at BCA. And again, this year, we put those questions into the um, into the application agreement, but we will be asking for documentation at the end of the year. And I believe this year will be the year that we start doing it to monitor like your budget and to make sure that you are financially viable. And when we talk about, again, financial viability, it just means you do not need our funds in order to keep to operate. Um, it's just extra funds that you use to provide a better meal. And everything that we give you for CACFP can only be spent on CACFP. If you're a school district, any child nutrition fund can be spent on child nutrition. So if you we give you money for CACFP, you could also spend it on the school lunch or the school breakfast program because it is all child nutrition. Child nutrition funds can be spent on child nutrition, any program. So again, if you were SD last year, or if you are new, you do have to fill out that 12 page VCA document and send us documentation before we can approve your application. So you can go out there and fill out your application all you want, but until we get the VCA with all the required documentation that we need, we cannot approve the application and agreement. So financial reports, like these are things that we're gonna look at during a review. So we will look at your financial viability while we come out to a review. So what are some things, what can we use um, to look at that? If you're a school district, you can just pull us your revenue and expenditure report for code 700. We're gonna need it for your child nutrition review as well if you are up for child nutrition review for school lunch, school breakfast. Um, but you can just pull us report for code 700 because that way we can see what you're doing for child nutrition, but we can also see what you're doing for code 769, which I'll talk about here in just a moment. If you're just a regular nonprofit, we can use a year to date report. We can use something from QuickBooks. We can use if you have an accountant. Any documentation that you use to close out your books at the end of the fiscal year is what we need to show that you're financially viable. So what this again means that you are in a positive status um, you may be subsidized. We have, if you're non, you know, like the nonprofits, you're not supposed to make a profit, but you may be getting subsidized. Say you're with a church and the church subsidizes your program. We need to see that. You'll show us what you're making, and then we'll ask to see what you get subsidized. So don't completely freak out if you do get subsidy, um, or because if you're a nonprofit, we understand. But we do have to see the documentation to see that you are getting these funds or how you're getting your funds to make sure that your doors do stay open. So other financial documentation that we will look at during a review in schools, you're just a little bit different. We look at your OCAS coding. Again, we're going to look at your expenditure and revenue report. We will look at invoices. Um, but again, we'll look at the total revenue and expenditure for your entire institution or center. But if, especially with our nonprofits, we're going to look at all bank and all credit card statements of accounts where CEC funds, funds are deposited or are transferred to. So if you are spending, wherever you're spending your money for CACFP, we'll look at that. So if you're buying food with a credit card, we're going to look at all those statements, bank statements, credit card statements, and then any funds where CACFP is deposited or transferred. We're going to look at those accounts um, when we come out to do a review. And again, a school district, we're just going to look at your OCAS coding because you have to, that's how you do your accounting method is by the OCAS. So just to give you guys an idea of what we look at when we come out to do a review. So now let's talk about eligibility. How can you um, be on this program? How can you be on at risk? So the eligibility requirements are, you have to be organized primarily to provide care in after school settings, which can be weekends, holidays, or school vacations, but during the school calendar year. So what that means is, is um, we're going into Christmas break. So during Christmas break, you can feed kids during Christmas break, like during the day, because it is during the school calendar year. School goes from August to May, but the school is out during Christmas break. But if it is going to be a day that school is in session, it has to be after school. Um, provide You have to provide an organized educational or enrichment activities. 
and it must be located in an attendance area where there's at least 50% of your students are eligible for free or reduced price meals. And again, this is in this book, ATR, it's on page 14. So some examples of area eligibility, we do have some waivers going on right now because of COVID, but to give you an idea is we have, it's called a low income report. So if you have a high school, so a school, so like I'm going to have an eating site I, at the State Department of Education. So I say I'm going to have the eating site right here at the State Department of Ed. And um, if I were to live here at the State Department of Ed, there is a school that I'd be assigned to. We all have live in a school district. So it'd be the school district where if I lived here, my kids would go to either elementary, middle, or high school. If as long as one of those schools are over 50% free and reduced, you can qualify to have a program there. So it just has to be either an elementary, middle, or high school. If any three of them qualify, then you can be on the program. We also have to have an area map. This is not for a school. Um, schools, you are the map, you're the area. Um, for anybody else, like a nonprofit, we have to have a copy of the map of where you're located. We have to see, so I'm from a very small town, one elementary school, technically in one high school. So what you could do is you could take a map of the district where I'm from, and then you could just draw on that district map where your location is, just to show that where your location is, that what schools, what school district you're in. Um, but we do have to know the school district or the site, and it's if you were to live at that site, where would your kids be attending school? And that's where we have to see, we have to just make sure that, because I mean, I live here in the city, and let's just say there's a school across the street. And I'll be like, well, yeah, that's the school that I would go to. And that's not always the case. It could be a school like five miles away. Even though there's a school right next to you, that may not be the school site that you're actually um, would go to if you lived at that site. With the area map, um, again, a school district does not have to give us an area map, but this is for our nonprofits or any daycare center coming on the program. Um, to at risk is if you live in Oklahoma City or Tulsa, I would tell you to go to Oklahoma City Public School or Tulsa Public School website and you can type in your address and it'd be the address where you eat, where your site is, and it will show you your elementary, middle and high school of where you would be, where you would go to. And that's the information that we need. If you're again, if you're a small district with one school, then you can just go, you can use like hometown locator or you can use great schools and just print out the district map and then you mark where you're at on that district map. And again, we have a lot of people that be like, well, there's a school right here, like a mile away. So that has to be the school that I would attend. And that's not always the case. So the way the districts are designed or where the, how they fall. So just make sure that you use the correct thing. The low income report, you have to use the latest low income report and we keep that and it's in um, others, it's in the resource library and it is under at risk. We have it in a couple of places, but one place you can find it is in at risk. We just need to have the one page that shows us. So say the school that I would be located in is say Wilson Elementary in Oklahoma City. I can go just to the Oklahoma, that one page that shows Wilson Elementary and just um, print that off and then you would send that in. We need a low income for everybody. The latest low income report we have is for fiscal year 2020. Um, we don't have one for 2021 and I don't know what's gonna happen for FY22. Um, we did do low income report this year, but I have a feeling that USDA, they're not going to use it. They're just going to use the one from 2020. We only need the low income report once every five years. So let's say that this year, the school that I'm at, it's 51% free and reduced. So I qualify. And let's say next year it falls to 40%. Well, that we use that one low income for five years. As long as in five years, it goes back up to 50% or more then you will be able to keep your site there. We don't really look at it every year. We only need it once every five years. Again, with the activities, they must, you must provide a regularly educational or enrichment activities in an organized, structured and supervised environment. They need to be open to all students. However, they do not have to participate. And um, the, the enrichment activity has not been waived for COVID. What we mean by it has to be open to all students is a good example is of a school district. Um, I had a school that did um, 
at risk and they had Century 21 grant going on. They had football, they had band, they had tutoring and they had a photography class and they had um, one other thing, something with FFA. And the deal is, is I can come in and eat even if I don't participate in any of those programs, but you do need to have activities that kids can participate in. It can't be where they're all closed activities. Like it can't be just athletics. It has to be open to other students. So a tutoring is a really good one to have. Um, like for instance, I could be, I could have a brother in Century 21 in the Century 21 and I go and eat and I just go sit in the cafeteria and eat and do my homework until he gets done. He's not participating in the programs, but he is allowed to eat, even though he is not enrolled in a particular, but you do need to have things available for kids to participate in. This program is good for any school age child um, through age 18 or 19 if they're in school. A person with a disability who meets the requirements of a person with disabilities, and this is up to age 21 in the state of Oklahoma. And then you must be participating in an approved after school care program. And, the, and there is a little bit of stuff going on right now, but the bit, mostly the meals do need to be consumed on site. But again, there's a little bit of a difference because of COVID, but um, in general, they, the meal has to be consumed on site. They can't take it with them. Athletic programs, again, they can participate, but it can't be limited to just athletes. You have to have programs for multiple people to be able to attend. Um, it can't just be like, well, we're only going to feed our basketball team. You can't do that. You need to have other activities that people can join or people can do um, and not just athletics. So the meals, you can offer a meal and a snack, and it can be reimbursed if they are after the school day has ended and or on weekends or holidays, including vacation periods. Again, we talked about like spring break, Christmas break, Thanksgiving break, fall break. Um, so either after the school day is ended or during the school calendar year, but um, during the school calendar year, but on a day that school is out. So eligibility for expanded learning time for schools. So a school operating one hour longer than the traditional school day of six hours might be eligible to serve in that seventh hour. You must have seven full hours of instruction time in order to serve in that seventh hour. So an example of that would be if lunch cannot be calculated, um, all schools must send us a copy every year of the bell schedule to determine when your school day ends. So your bell schedule is the class schedule that you give accreditation. So to be on the program for a school district, any site that you have, um, we do have to have a copy of the bell schedule in order to approve your school. Because we have to see. So if you have a school and your instructional time is from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m., you cannot do it um, in the seventh. You cannot do it before three o'clock because you only have six hours of instructional time. Now, if you have instructional time from 7.45 to 3.45, and you serve lunch for 30 minutes, then you would be able to serve in your seventh hour, which would start at, at 3.15. So it has to be either after the school day is ended or possibly in your seventh hour. But again, we need a copy of your bell schedule to make sure that you're, you are serving at the correct time. You cannot serve this meal. Again, the intent of the program is for after school care. Summer meals, you cannot serve these meals in the summer. So once school starts, let's just say it's May 15th and school, I'm sorry, say school begins August 15th and ends May 15th, you can serve meals from August 15th to May 15th. Um, if the school that your area that you're in, if, if they're done with school by May 15th, by May 16th, you cannot serve these meals. We have some nonprofits on here. So what you can do in schools, you guys can do our summer feeding. So you guys can contact D Houston if you want more information about summer feeding. Schools can also participate in SSO, which they're doing currently. But just kind of an FYI, a reminder that you cannot, once summer begins, you cannot serve these meals uh, for at risk. That It's only during the school calendar year. 
So if you're applying for at risk, what's the documentation that we need for you to be able to come onto the program? So you do have to have your management plan or your VCA with the appropriate documentation. If you have multiple sites, you have to, we have to have a copy of what we call the national disqualified list. It's the NDL list. What the NDL list is on our CACFP side, if you get terminated, so on the CACFP side, you can be terminated if you're not if the program's not being ran very well and there's steps to do it, we don't just terminate you. There's lots of steps that we have to go through. Um, but if you get terminated from the program, those individuals that were involved at that location, like wherever it was at, um, they cannot have anything to do with CACFP for seven years. They go, it, so if you type in someone's name and they show up on this NDL list, they cannot have anything to do with the program or you're gonna be automatically we can't approve you because we can't have anybody that is on the NDL list helping with this program. And we also have to have a copy of a license or DHS documentation if a license is not required. Um, schools, you are exempt from this. And then we also have to have the required documentation for at risk, which we have to have a copy of the area map. It's not required for schools, but if you are not a school, we have to have a copy of the map of what district that you're in. We have to have a copy of the low income report data. We have to have the school district calendar. So if I have a eating site right here at the State Department of Education, I am in Oklahoma City Public Schools District, I would have to get a copy of the Oklahoma City Public Schools District's calendar. Um, so it has to show the beginning day and the ending day of school to make sure that you're not serving meals when you cannot. And then for schools, we have to have a copy of the bill schedule. That is if you're new. If you're renewing, meaning you've been on the program and you're just renewing for the next fiscal year, we only have to have VCA if you were seriously deficient in the previous year. Um, we have to have, a, again, a copy of the school calendar that's for everybody, um, showing your first and last day. For school districts, we have to have a copy of your bell schedule. If you're multi-sided, we have to show that you have attempted to look, you've looked at the NDL list and then also we only look at the low income report again, one every five years. So I think Jennifer got new ones like two years ago. So everybody should be up to date with that right now. Um, I think she redid everybody's in the same year just to make it easy. So, all right, let's talk about record keeping. This starts on page A15 of the training manual. And as a reminder, um, all forms must be maintained daily by month at each site for any institution participating in CACFP. Your, your records have to be where you state that they are in your application agreement. And they can't be like taken home, like they have to be where you said they're gonna be located. At risk, we need to have attendance records, enrollment documentation, a sign-in sheet, which I would highly recommend, and I'll talk more about that, and a mill count worksheet. And again, you can find that on A19 or A21, and we also have some forms in the resource library that you can use as well. We have interactive forms. If you go down to the very bottom, it says worksheets. That's all of our interactive forms that you can type into. So this is a copy of what it looks like. If you have something that works, that's fine. You can definitely use what what you're using, but we have to have something that shows attendance. So, and then something that shows enrollment. Now, what I talk about a sign-in sheet is because, again, I mentioned a student earlier who could be at the cafeteria just eating, waiting for his brother. So he can eat without actually being enrolled in a program. Well, my suggestion is, is you have, say you have five different programs going on and they're all have enrollment. And so you're doing attendance records, but you want to do a sign-in sheet. I would do a sign-in sheet for those kids that are not enrolled in one of those programs, um, but they're still eating. One, because say you have 80 kids enrolled, but you have hundred meals that you're claiming and you have the documentation showing that you had 20 extra kids pop up um, that are just eating. So I would create a sign-in sheet for those kids that are not enrolled um, in one of your programs or your organizations, but they did eat a meal. Oh. Huh, okay, so Teresa, I just saw, this is the first thing that's popped up is your, your little comment on the chat. So, um,
So you've been on at risk for three or four years. But like, so, but I think two years ago, um, Jennifer, when she came on or last year, when Jennifer came on the program or came into that CACFP role, she just got new stuff for everybody. She kind of cleaned up all of our records. So our records were kind of a mess to make sure we had everything. So, but every five years we need the low income report, but we do, if you renew, we still have to have those documentations every year with you renew. So other things that we need, we have to have a menu, a serve form, or also schools, you can use a production record. Um, we also need a food purchasing form, which schools, you really won't need a food purchasing form. Um, expenditure reimbursement worksheet. Again, schools, we're just gonna use your revenue and expenditure report because of how you guys do your accounting method. And then every year you have to have staff and civil rights training. So the food purchasing form is required to itemize each receipt that you receive from a store. And we're talking about those paper receipts like this. So if you shop like at Walmart, Crest, Brahms, Reesers, Kroger, Homeland, those types of places with the original receipt, that's when you have to do the food purchasing form because those receipts are not itemized. That's what the food purchasing form does is it itemizes those receipts. Um, if you have some items that you have bought that don't count towards the program, you will still put them on this form. You'll just put them in the non-reimbursable section. This form, again, you'll do one per receipt, and you may have to have a couple of forms depending on how much you're spending. But um, again, you list how many you purchase, the unit size, and what it was. Now, something that I have seen before, um, I've this happened to me. I was at, because if we don't know what it is, you can't charge it off. You have to put it in the non reimbursable. So I was at, it's actually a summer review, and she, I, she does at risk. She did at risk as well, but I was working her summer, and she had on here, um, it said like HP365X. And I was like, well, what is this HP35X? And she's like, well, I don't know. I'm like, well, if you don't know what it is, I, we have to remove it because I don't know what it is. And she called, it was from Walmart, and she found out it was ink, it was ink for her printer, which she could have used because she printed stuff off for CACFP. Well, it really needed to be in food, re in food related supplies. So um, if you don't know what it is, if it says something funky, put what it says on the receipt and then next to it, put what it actually is. Because if you don't know what it really is, and I don't know what it really is, I can't count it because I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's allowable for CACFP. But that's what this form does. Again, say you want to buy pop or gum, you can, this total right here at the bottom has to match your receipt. It can be a penny off and it might be if you're dividing it up by three ways because it has the taxes right here, but this needs to match your receipt. Now on the form, if you want to use the electronic version over on this side right over here, if you can see my cursor, it will have a place where you can put the taxes and it'll automatically calculate the taxes for you. And just remember, like I'm in Oklahoma City. Um, I live close to Edmond. I do a lot of stuff in Edmond. I live close to the village. I live close to War Acres. So it depends on where I shop, depending on what my taxes are. So, or you may just be tax free and you don't have to have taxes in there. So this is again, for those that shop at stores with those paper receipts that the, the receipts are not itemized. Now you do not have to do this form if you do have an itemized receipt. And an itemized receipt will show the quantity, the weight, the size, and the price. Um, so these receipts are like from a food and milk vendor, like if you're getting Highland or for Cisco, Benny Keith, US Foods, Tankersley, they're very detailed. Um, if you do grocery pickup or grocery delivery, they're also very detailed. Like I do Walmart delivery. I'm legally blind. I have no peripheral. I can only see directly in front of me. So I haven't driven in three years. So I have my groceries delivered. And those those receipts, like they have a picture of what I bought. They'll say like, I bought three um, 32 ounce boxes of Cheerios with the picture. So those are very detailed. They're itemized. So I do not have to do a food purchasing form. Um, but one thing that we would have you do now I, with Benny Key, Cisco, Tankersley, U.S. Foods, I've seen those where it has like the food and milk, and then I'll have like the next page, the, your supplies. 
Um, but like Walmart and stuff, it's going to just have everything in there. So if you do have like, say, supplies, like foil, paper plates, and then you have food, you still, if you can at the bottom, just put like food and milk in the total and then just put supplies in the total because you still have to break that up on the expenditure worksheet. Schools, you don't have to really worry about this. Um, we look at your expenditure revenue report because we know how you code everything. So that's all we're gonna ask to look for, but we will wanna see your receipts, but you always usually buy from a vendor. So that's why you don't have to do the food purchasing form. We do wanna see your invoices. So on receipts and invoices, just some things that we have seen. If you have the paper copy, the ones from like Brahms, Crest, Walmart, Reesers, Kroger, those type of places, um, Piggly Wiggly, um, we have to have a copy of the original receipt. Even if it's faded, we still have to have the original. Um, it, it, so just if you don't have the original, then we can't accept it. We can't accept just a copy. Um, in a receipt that is altered is only a copy or if someone cuts off the bottom, we can't, we have to disallow it. Or if there's no date on there, we don't know when you bought it. So I can't say that you bought it for July if there's no date on there. I don't know when you bought it. Um, also, if you do um, grocery pickup or grocery delivery, we will not accept any receipt except for after you pick it up. So if it says still in process or submitted, we will not allow that receipt. And with those, you can always go back into your account and print it out. Um, we can't do that because again, I get groceries delivered and this happened to me yesterday. I had groceries delivered. I had six items. And two showed up. I only had two that showed up out of the six, which is actually the person that delivered it to me. She forgot to give me a bag. So I didn't get all my order. But that's why we have to have the, the, the last invoice because you may not get everything or they may substitute something on you. Um, receipts and invoices, we will validate your receipts and invoices with bank and credit card statements. Because we do understand too, like those that shop at Sam's, if you go through Sam's and do the click and go, where you can go through and do the click, it's I think called click and go. Um, when you print it out, your receipt, it won't have a barcode at the bottom. And that's why we'll also use your, your receipts and your invoices to make sure that that purchase came from you. Because we do know that those receipts do not have barcodes. So you do the food purchasing form or your receipts. You have that every receipt that you use for CACFP purposes for the whole month. And at the end of the month, you do what we call an expenditure reimbursement worksheet. You put everything that was allowable to be spent for CACFP and you put it on, again, this um, expenditure worksheet, which again, schools, we look at your district OCAS coding so you do not have to do this other form. Um, again, it's only items or services solely used for CACFP. So what allowable services are, are all expenses charged off to CACFP. One, it has to be in your budget and it has to be approved by our office. So if say you are wanting to, maybe your microwave went out and you buy a new microwave using CACFP funds, you're charging it off to CACFP, say it's $300 and it's not in your budget, then we cannot let you, then when we come out there, we'll take it off of your expenditure worksheet because it's not in your budget. Now we're working towards all this. So if we, right now, if we come out and see it that, hey, you bought this microwave, but it's not in your budget, we're gonna tell you to go into your budget and add it to small equipment and then have us approve it. Um, it's, this is a work in progress, but this is what we're saying is if you're gonna charge it off, it has to be in your budget and that your budget's gonna be updated quite a bit throughout the year. Um, items that are used for the entire center, say if you have a daycare center and you buy paper towels and you use them for the bathroom and for the kitchen, you have to prorate it. You can't just say, oh, I'm spending all this on CACAP when you spend it on an, when you spend it on center as well. Um, in a list of some, uh, we do, if you're not sure what's allowable or not allowable, we have somewhat of a list. It's not all inclusive on page A60 that you can look at in the training manual. This is what the expenditure worksheet looks like. So what, again, what you do is at the end of the month, you put here at the top, they put all the groceries, they put all the receipts that they had for that month. We validate it, we look at all the receipts and then they put how much they had. And this was their food purchases and then non-food purchases like paper plates, foil, that kind of thing. Down here, they added labor. And then um, 
I'm just going to give you an idea of what this what this shows us and why the importance of this is. So down here, what they did was is they added all the food purchases and the labor or and the non-food purchases, and then they added labor to this. So this is how much this is their cook and some teachers that help them serve meals. And it says how much time that they spent on helping serve meals. This is how much time they spent on CACFP per day. And what they did was is at the end of the month, they took their total labor that they spent for that month for CACFP in food and milk, and they put it right here. So it says $2,737.40 is what they spent on CACFP. In column 15 right here, this middle section, this is how much we reimburse them. So they have a, 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 a um, operating balance of $1,800. Why is that important? Why is this information important to us? So the reason why it's important is there's two things about our financials that we look at. One is that you're financially viable. It means you as an organization as a whole, or if you're a school district, we're looking at your child nutrition as a whole, because um, we do know how school, schools are supposed to be ran. Um, so well, we're gonna look at child nutrition program as a school, but we're gonna look as a whole organization. Um, if you're like a nonprofit, we need to see your organization to make sure you're financially viable that in case there's no funds that get, that we can pay you that you can still buy the food. The, on the flip side, we have what's called a nonprofit food service account, which schools, you're very familiar with this term. You can have what we have called a three month operating balance. And I'll kind of talk a little bit about that. But what it means is, is the money that we give you for CACFP, you have to spend that much money or more on, back onto the program. You can't make money on the federal government. So if we give you, say, $1,000 a month in reimbursement, you need to spend at least $1,000, if not more, every month. You have to spend all the money that we give you back into the program, back into CACFP. You cannot make money on it. Now, we do have what we call a three-month operating. So what that means is you can, you, can for, you can carry forward just a little bit of funds. Um, so like, say, you can't, you, know, you can't do this program in summer. So say you're not feeding any kids in the summer and school was let out in May and you're going to do it again in August. Well, you have a little bit of funds that you could buy food so you could start the program again in August. So that's why we allow for a little bit of carryover so you have a way to pay for food for the next year. But mostly what we give you needs to be spent back into the program. We've had issues this past year. Actually, it's been going on for a couple of years. Let's say we give you um, $1,000 a month. And then we look at their expenditure worksheet and they're telling us that out of that $1,000 a month that they spent $200 on food, milk, and labor. Well, that means they just made a profit of $800 and you cannot do that. You have to spend all the money that we give you back into the program. You have to be nonprofit in CACFB. You have to spend all the money that we give you back into that program. And it's, you spending it, you're telling us how you spend it. So like I said, maybe you you needed a new microwave. So you bought a microwave with the funds. And that's what happens. So what, when we come out to do a review, we're going to look at your last expenditure worksheet and say that we give you $1,000 a month and you spent $500 that month. Then we're going to ask to see your back. We're going to go back a few months to see if you spend it someplace else. Like I had a daycare recently say they can't find paper plates. They bought real plates. So on their expenditure worksheet, they show that they bought real plates. Um, so that $100 purchase that can go on their expenditure worksheet because um, they spent it on CACFP funds. So you just have to have receipts to back everything up. If there's not a receipt for it, then we can't back it up. Again, we mentioned that you can add labor. Not everybody will need to add labor, but some people may need to add labor and you can. You can add your operating labor, which is your food service labor, or you can add your administrative labor. Again, it has to be in the budget and it has to be approved. And we get this question a lot, but yes. So say you have a cook, your cook leaves, you have a new cook. Um, you need to go put your new cook in there. You, we now have to have your budget by name. We would say leave the old cook in there because if we come back and we're looking at records, we have to see that because we look at pay stubs. If, we, if you're charging somebody's labor off, we have to look at pay stubs. We verify it. You cannot charge off more than what that person's being paid. Um, and again, it has to be in the budget. And an example of that is I was at a daycare and they were charging their, their cook, their whole salary to CACAP, which was very reasonable. It was $1,000 a month, which was 
again, reasonable for a cook to be paid a month at a daycare center. And when I asked to pull their pay stubs, when I pulled the pay stubs, this person only got paid $1,200 a year. Well, you can't charge off $1,000 a month when they're only making $200 a month. They can only charge off $200 a month. If you are a nonprofit or if you're a daycare center and you don't pay yourself, you can't charge off funds because you're not getting paid. We have to verify it with a pay stub. If you're paying anybody with cash, Venmo, or Cash App, we can't allow that. We have to see that taxes were taken out. So if you're paying people with cash, we can't do labor again. We have to see that taxes and stuff were taken out of labor. And again, we talked about um, some of the financial stuff that we look at. We again, will look at bank and credit card statements of accounts where purchases for CACFP funds were made. For labor, if you, if you say you have a bank account, like a, bank, a you use a credit card to pay for all your purchases, and then you have a bank account that you use for your labor, we're going to look at both of those accounts. So, or if you're transferring funds from CACFP to another, we're going to look at any fund where CACFP money touches or is expended, we will look at those accounts. And schools, again, we're going to look at your revenue and expenditure report for code 700. We do not allow for donated products. And I'm not talking about commodities. You can do commodities. We're talking about um, if I just say, hey, I wanna give you 10 pounds of um, bread. If someone just comes up and is like, hey, I wanna give you 10 pounds of bread, you cannot use it on the program. It has to be an extra. You don't have a receipt for it. Um, and we're paying people for reimbursement. And that's what we were finding. A lot of people were getting a lot of stuff donated, but they weren't spending the money that we were giving them for the program and it became too much of a problem. So no more donated anything. You can use it, but it can't be part of the reimbursable mill. If you, are, if you have multiple sites, um, so say we've had this happen where you have a daycare center and you have three daycare centers and they each have their own agreements. So they're each what we call single-sided on our end, but you, one person owns all three of them. If that's the case, you cannot share receipts. Every center has to have their own receipt. If you have one agreement number and three centers under it, then you can, you can, you can share receipts. Um, if you are multi-sided in general, where you have the one agreement and three, you do have to have an expenditure worksheet for each site. And the reason for that is, is because when we do a review, we do a percentage and that way we're not looking at all of your centers all together. We're looking at individual centers. So reimbursement and revenue, um, the rates for CACFP come out in July. Um, reimbursement is allowed again for one meal and one snack. Um, CACFP at risk revenue can be used on any child nutrition program. So again, if you're a school district and you need a new milk box, you can buy it that you use for lunch and supper pro or lunch and breakfast. You can buy it because you're using it for child nutrition. And here's the OCAS codes for CACFP. Let's talk about some other records. I keep on getting hot and cold, so I keep turning my heater on. Um, so CACFP forms, if you're using any forms that are not found in the CACFP training manual, in the resource library, in the school training manual, or the other documents, then you need to get approval from your consultant first before you can use it. Um, we've had some situations here recently where people were started using their own. A lot of people that have their own forms, they're better than our forms. We'll be honest, they're better than our forms. But we've had some that were using their own forms and it lacked a lot of information that we needed and it resulted in an overclaim. So now we just say, if, if you can't find the form in any of our manuals, anything with child nutrition, then you need to ask for approval. Just send it to your um, specialist and say, hey, I need to change that word from consultant to specialist. Um, just put in there, hey, can I use this form for inventory? Can I use this form for attendance records? Just let them know what you're using. Building for the future, if you're on at risk, you do have to have building for the future. If you're multi-sided, you do have to send a copy to us to upload into the system. This is what it looks like right here. Um, so right here in this little box at the bottom where you see that hand, uh, it says sponsoring organization. 
right here is where you put your school name or your center information or your nonprofit information. If you're a nonprofit, you do need to hand this out to everybody that participates in the program. You have to send this out once a year. If you're a school district because you're on other programs, we would say post this someplace in a visible location, but also maybe put a stack just someplace that kids can pick it up. But they understand you're also on the school lunch program, the school breakfast program. So that's why we're not saying you have to send this out to like a thousand kids. You can just post one in a visible location and then um, you can put a little stack someplace, but you do not have to hand it out specifically to every child as unless you're a nonprofit, then we're gonna tell you to do that. Something that is required this year that started is you do, it is required to have inventory for food and milk. We're requiring inventory for all unopened items that you have on hand at the end of the month. This is for both food and milk. Um, you do have to do this once a month. Schools, you can just continue to use the system. Schools are required to do inventory. So you do a perpetual inventory for commodities and you usually do a monthly inventory for food. You can continue what you're doing. You do not have to do this inventory, um, but you do have to do inventory. Uh, so this is the example that we have and you may like this one better. So schools, you can use this form by all means. It's two pages, it's front and back. We have this in interactive forms and we have this um, in the training manual. It's split up by component. So we have the meat, meat alternate, grain, bread, fruit, and vegetable. And then on the back, we have milk formula, which a lot of you are not gonna have formula. Baby food, infant food, a lot of you are not, don't have infants, so you won't have to fill with that. And then we have condiments extra and then CCFP related supplies. That's like your foil and stuff. The last two are not required to fill out. But if it is a component, it is required. But you can fill it out. Like if you do want to be like, no, I have ketchup and mayonnaise that's in the in the kitchen. It's I have an inventory. Um, then you can put it down there, but it's not required. Again, you're going to do this once a month at the end of the month for what you have on hand that's not opened. So that way you're not having to write every single thing down that you have. Um, but I have talked to some people that they already do inventory and they already do keep everything that they have on hand. They do a perpetual inventory and that works best for their center because um, they've been doing it for so long. And if you want to do that, talk to your consultant and just say, hey, listen, I'm going to do a perpetual. And this is why like one center that we talked to, it's because their, their kitchen is so small that she's like, I don't have any room. So I have to know what I have at all times because. Um, if I run out of anything, I can't really have a lot on hand. So anyway, if you are going to do a different method, if you want to use a different inventory, please contact your consultant first. We did add some new forms to this manual. Um, again, we added the inventory, which I just showed you. We have the mill service change form that we talked about earlier. Um, if you're going to revise your claim, you have to do a claim revision form. We added that to the manual this year. And we also have the review of notification letter. So if you are not sure, and so we've always, we haven't had the review of notification letter, but we do have a checklist. And I did update the checklist to be what you need for at risk because it did get very confusing because like it would have applications in there, but at risk, you don't have to have applications. So we, that's why we did the books is because people were getting confused on what they had to do if they're a regular daycare or if you're at risk. So that's why we broke up all the manuals to be specific to what programs that you're doing. We did add something to our CACAP forms and we did add a, a section of each form that's a required form that says form completed by. Now this does not have to be a signature. It can just be printed or you can type it. But we just want to know who did the form. And the reason why, like, this is the milk count worksheet. I know it says infant, but let's just say it's a child milk count worksheet. And let's say I'm looking at your numbers and I do the, the math. And my numbers that I'm getting are not what you guys got. And so we just want to know who do we go talk to? Who did that form? Who did it? So that way we can go and just have a conversation. Because, you know, like in a school district, you could have four people doing different things with the program. Um, it, so that's why we just want to know who did it. So just who, who do we ask questions if we have any questions regarding that form? With claims, 
Um, we cannot pay a claim after 60 days. Payment notices should be kept on file. Any claim that you have to make a revision on or you need a revision, you have to do the fill out the claim revision form and send it to us or before we can approve it. And then again, we have a monthly record keeping checklist to help ensure all records are completed. And again, this has been updated, that monthly record keeping checklist to show um, what you need for at risk. Because again, there was things that listed on there that you don't need for at risk. It was for regular daycare centers. So we kind of cleaned all that stuff up. One question that we do get is um, in CECFP, we do take back funds, we, um, which we can in schools too. But people ask us like, what would happen? Like what would cause an error for us to take back money? Some of those would be, this is not all inclusive. This is just some of the things that we have seen is if we show up and you have no records, if your meal counts are not properly maintained or there's incorrect numbers, so say you're, you got your math off and you claimed 150 mils and you're really supposed to claim 140, um, if any records or documentation does not support the claim, because we're validating the claim, we're validating what you um, claimed with us, we're validating the number of kids, all of that stuff. Um, if you share receipts with another facility, if you're claiming adults, adults are not allowed to be claimed, only children. If you have any food items that you indicated as being served, but there, there's no food on the receipts and they're not on your inventory, then we will take those meals back. So in a good example of that is say you, you purchased 20 gallons of milk and based on your receipts and inventory, you purchased 20 gallons of milk. But when I'm looking at your menu as serve forms, it said that you needed 50 gallons of milk. So if you only bought 20 gallons of milk and you were supposed to serve 50 gallons of milk, well, you're going to take back all the meals back for that month because we don't know what days had milk. We don't know if they, if any of them had enough milk. So we take back, if you're short on milk, we take back every meal with milk in it for the month of radio. Before my time, it used to be if you were short milk in one month, we took back every meal back to the beginning of the year. So we're pretty serious about the food that you're buying. We, we look at receipts to see what you're buying to make sure it matches. So now let's talk about training and civil rights for at risk. So it is required that an institution or entity that you must have a CACFP trainer designated at your, your location. You have to have someone at your entity or your school district that's going to train your staff. Um, so in, in schools, we have ABVM where you're required to come to our training, which again, now you're required to come to our training, but someone at your facility has to train your staff. There are annual trainings. You have to document it, have an agenda, tell us the topics and signature of the attendees. You must keep a sign-in sheet. And then you have to do training once a year. Um, so make sure all your training is completed by September 30th. When you do training, you can do it meeting style or you can do it conference style or one-on-one. -on -one. Um, the topics are CACFP meal patterns, reimbursement system, accurate meal counts, claim submission, claim review process, record keeping and civil rights. Um, so when we talk about it can be conference style or one on one is maybe you have one person that's your backup because you do the claims. So you have one person that's your backup so you can go over with them the claim submission and say the claim review process. Um, but maybe you want your whole center you want them to know about CACFP meal patterns accurate meal counts record keeping so you can pick and choose like I want this person only to know about claim submission and I want these 10 people to know about CACP meal patterns and you can do them all at the same time you could do it like here's a 20 minute session we're going to go over meal patterns here's a 10 minute session we're going over claim submission but you just have to make sure all of these topics are covered every single year state agency training which is us training is required if you're new and you're coming onto the program 
Training is required if you're what we call seriously deficient or SD. And what that is, is like, it, so what we do is we come out and do a review. And if the review just does not go well at all, there's a lot of errors. It, we will deem you what we call seriously deficient. You had more than 25% error. And when you're seriously deficient, you are required to come to training and you have within 60 days to complete that training from the exit conference. If you don't attend training, that's automatic termination. So you have to attend training if you're SD. And if this is started this year, but if you're if you want to renew your application, we will not approve your application and agreement until you attend training. Also with our training, as I mentioned earlier, you have to log into the training calendar and you can see the arrow down there on the corner of where the training calendar is. Once you log in, you do have to be um, registered for any of our training. That's how you get credit. So if you're going to attend any Zoom or in-person training, that person that's watching or whoever must be registered in the training calendar. If you're not in the training calendar, then we can't give you credit because we saw you in Zoom, but you're not in the training calendar. If you have not registered in the training calendar, you have until 9 p.m. tonight to do so. So you can always still register if you have not already, but you have to be registered to receive the credit for the training. If you want some additional training, we also have, so we have our live and Zoom trainings, but we also have what's called OSDE Connect. These are self-paced trainings. Um, if you go into the resource library under training, um, training and workshops, you can, you can pull up the instructions and it lists everything that we offer. Like this training is going to be out there after this training. We'll put at risk out there. We're going to put meal patterns out there. We'll put all of these out there. So if someone doesn't want to attend a live training, they can do the um, OSDE Connect training, which will be, again, online and it's self-paced. And these, those will, once you complete the training, they will print you out a certificate. If you want any additional training, we have team nutrition and then ICN. ICN, um, they cover every child nutrition topic you can imagine. They're self-paced. Uh, team nutrition has a lot of webinars. And then cooking for kids is something that as a state, uh, we've been doing cooking with kit for kids since 2012 with our school districts. Um, they're going to start doing that for CACFP now. They're going to go over a lot of like recipe ideas. They go we go over the regulations, but they go over like cooking skills, recipes, um, things like that. And I know we have some schools on here, but we just uploaded some cooking for kids information, some trainings in OSDE Connect yesterday. Civil rights, all staff must be trained in civil rights. If you have not taken civil rights yet, you can go out to OSDE Connect, there is a code. So that's why you need to go get the instructions. If you're a school district and you've already had civil rights, you did it on the school side, you don't have to take it again for CACFP. You just have to take it one time. Um, but if you have not taken it at all, if you're a school, you need to take either the school or CACFP. Um, if you're CACFP, go out to the resource library under trainings and workshops. We have one deal that says just for um, civil rights, or you can just pull up our instructions for OSD Connect and it's there as well. It's in both places. Civil rights. So civil rights is if you pass out any documentation that's going to be sent out to the public, you have to have a non-discrimination statement on there. Now, like the building for the future or any other form that came from us, it's going to have it on there. But the big thing for if you if you send your men, menus out, you need to make sure your document your non-discrimination statement is on your menus if you're if they're being sent out of your center or your location. Um, a lot of people will just post a menu and that's fine, but if it's leaving the facility, then you need to have the non-discrimination statement on there. If you post your menus online, it needs to have the non-discrimination statement on there. You also have to have an injustice for all poster and it'll be 11 by 17. If you're new, we're gonna be giving you one, but make sure that you have one, you just need one in a visible location you do need to have procedures for filing a complaint, and that is in the training manual. It's also in the resource library. If anybody does have a civil rights complaint for CACFP, um, 
the only way that the only area of the discrimination would be for race, color, national origin, sex, age, and disability. That's what USDA recognizes. This is the first half of the non-discrimination statement. It is in the training manual. You can copy and paste if you need to. So um, if you do need to put it on your documentation, you can, and you can shrink it down as little as you need to. This is the first half, and this is the second half. It is quite lengthy. But again, this is for anything that you might be using for CACFP, and really the thing that we always just see is menus. And it's mostly at a school district. So, But a lot of our daycare side, so I'm not for sure about the non, you know, our nonprofits on here, but you just may have, um, you just may have a, um, a menu that you just post. You don't send it out to anybody. I'm getting so many spam calls today. It's driving me crazy. I think I've gotten five since we've been doing this. Okay, the injustice for all, this is what it does look like. So again, if you are on the program, make sure you have some one of these posted someplace in a visible location at your facility or at, just at your location. With civil rights, it is no longer allowed to report a child's race by visual observation. So a child can be multiracial because ours only said like if you're one or the like one race. Um, it's not required. So a lot of you are going to get it on, say, an application. Well, you're for at risk, you're not required to do applications. But like with the school, if you got a school application, if the parent filled it out. Um, for you that are not, if you're at risk and you're just a nonprofit, um, you may want to make your own form to obtain racial information, racial ethnic information. We can't require the family to fill it out, but it's just a tool that you can use to be like, okay, this is what we have if the parents want to fill it out. We're still waiting on more guidance from USDA. So if we find out anything more about this, we will keep you posted. But just to let you know, like you, like I'm not allowed as a monitor anymore. Like I had to do it. Is I supposed to come out and just visually look and be like, oh, you have 10 kids. And I had I had to sit here and look at them and tell, and I wrote down what I thought their race was. So one, I'm not, we're not allowed to do that anymore. Same with you. And not just that, but kids could be multiracial. They shouldn't just be, a lot of kids are just not one race. And that was the problem too, is that we only look, identified one. Um, so now we would really like the parents to self-identify. Are you guys doing okay? We're almost, we're almost at the very end. So we're finishing up. We'll be done quite soon. That's why I kind of haven't stopped for a break because I figure a two hour training will be fine, which I had a lot of water, so. Okay, let's talk about procurement. Um, I will be doing a big procurement training um, next month at the end of January. It'll be for all entities, schools, daycares, nonprofits, for everyone. So I'm just giving you the highlights, and this is for what we see a lot for CACFP, not really for schools. Um, schools do small purchase, be, you, and they do have a, procure, a separate procurement review, which they want to do with CACFP, which we're really hoping they don't. Um, but when we talk about procurement, it's all purchases. We, when it, we need to make sure that you're spending federal dollars appropriately and make sure that there is full and open competition. Um, you do have to have a procurement plan, which is a written procedures. We do have a procurement plan that you can use. If you're a school, make sure you're using the one in other documents on the school side. It will cover you for everything. Um, daycare side, we have a small one for you if you're spending under $250,000. If you're spending over that at a store with or with a vendor, then we have you need to use the school one and I can send that to you. It is out there. It is called the formal one. Um, your procurement plan must have the methods of procurement, which I'll talk about. Code of conduct, it has to have a statement regarding minority firms, women's business enterprise and labor surplus and a chart of procedures. Now our, our procurement plan does have all of this stuff. Um, the CACFP side, the small one, the chart of procedures is not attached to the procurement plan. It's a separate, it's a one page document. Um, just make it just, if you need help with it, you can contact me, I don't mind. But also there's a great example in here for the chart of procedures. It's really, really easy to fill out. The two methods, the main methods are informal and formal. And I'm really just gonna talk mostly about formal. I will tell you what formal is, but really most of our centers or most people under CACFP are only doing informal. 
So what that is, is um, I'm going to explain what it is because people just look at the dollar amount like, oh, I'm spending less than that. So that's what I'm doing. And that's not the case. So what micro purchasing is, is yes, that each transaction does not exceed $10,000. However, micro purchasing is when you're buying your CACFP stuff from multiple sources. You're spreading the wealth. You don't check prices, but the prices are reasonable. So what that means is, is you're buying milk from Highland, milk from Brahms, groceries from Walmart, groceries from Crest, paper from Staples, um, supplies from Restaurant Depot, uh, supplies from Sam's. So you're buying all of your stuff or even supplies from Amazon. You're buying all of your stuff for CACFP from multiple sources, but you don't check prices um, you just purchase it, but the prices are reasonable. But most of you really are doing small purchase. What small purchase is, is you're spending less than $250,000 per bid, per solicitation, per store. Um, it's when you check prices. So if you can tell me that milk at Brahms is $3.50 and milk at Sam's is $3.75, you just did small purchase. You checked prices. As long as you're checking prices with two sources, then you did small purchase. If you're saying, well, I just buy my stuff from Walmart grocery, I do grocery delivery, that's the only thing I do, then you have to do small purchase. You have to check prices. And you can do it like once a year. You can even be like, yeah, I went to Crest. Crest was cheaper overall, but, and you have to explain to us, but I'm doing Walmart grocery pickup because it saves me time and labor. And Crush doesn't uh, does that does not offer that, which I did find out recently. I have not clearly I haven't done it yet, but um, Brahms now does grocery pickup. So I guess they have an app that you can do grocery pickup on. I saw an advertisement for that recently. So again, I have a slide again of what the difference is between micro purchasing and small purchasing. If you're using a vendor like Benny Key, Cisco, Tankersley, U.S. Foods, then you're you need to do small purchase. Um, because like a grocery store, I can go to the stores and look at prices or just buy from several places. But you don't know what Benny Key's prices are or Tankers or your U.S. foods. You have to have them send you back prices. So that's why you have to send to at least two different sources so they can give you those prices. And with small purchase, you do not have to go with the lowest vendor, but you have to explain to us why you did justify why you did. What formal is, is if you're spending over $250,000 per bid, per solicitation, or per, per store, um, you do have to put an ad in the paper. Um, you have to have specifications. We have what's called a sealed bid or an RFP. Um, one is based, you, you award it based on price alone, and the other one has a lot of other factors. But again, this is a lot more in depth. So if you are spending over that, or a school and you're spending over that per bid, per solicitation, per store, um, contact me and we can definitely help you with that. Let me see, I may have another poll for you to take. Oops, let's see here. Okay, let's see here. All right, I thought I had a poll. I do not. Um, does anybody in here, because if no one does, I'm not really going to talk about it, but does anybody in here contract for food? Not food service management company, but like you contract with the school district and every day they have, they bring you a cooked meal and then you serve it out and you have a contract and you pay per meal. Not food service management company with the school district, but someone that delivers hot food to you every day and you serve that out. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and go over, okay. What about my nonprofits? Um, so we'll, we'll talk about contracting for services. If you're gonna contract for any services, 
Um, the institution does have to have final administration and financial responsibility. You cannot contract for critical management functions. You can have services like accounting, building maintenance. It's anything that you're using for CACFP. If it's not for CACFP, then you don't have to have a contract. Um, but you do, if you have a contract, you have to send it to us first before you can award the contract. Um, I'm going to just quickly go over contracting for food service. Again, this is if you have an agreement with the school or agreement with the vendor and every, every day they bring you a hot meal and you serve it out. Um, how, how, what, what it does is what the timeline is, is so say I'm a daycare and I have an agreement with the school district. That school district has, is responsible for those production records. But then what happens is if I have a school or a vendor that brings me meals, every day they bring meals. And with that meal, they have what we call a contract meal delivery receipt. This, the institution or the, whoever is claiming those meals that the CACFP institution, that they're claiming it, they keep those um, contract meal delivery receipts. That is what the center uses as their menu as serve form records. And then at the end of the month, the school or that vendor will bill CACFP institution for the meals that they bought from them. And then that CACFP institution turns around and gets claimed for reimbursement with us. Now, something that happens a lot, um, I have several entities that save their license for 25 day, for 25 kids. And every morning they get the person that's delivering the food brings them 25 meals. But then they'll be like, call us by 9 a.m. to let us know how many kids you have for lunch, and we'll just bring you that many meals for lunch. So an example that we have is, is say that you're licensed for 25, and so the vendor sends you 25 meals, but you only have 18 that show up for breakfast. That vendor is going to charge you for 25 meals because that's what they sent you. But you can only claim 18 meals because that's how many were in attendance you can only claim the amount of meals that a kid consumed, one meal. You can't just be like, well, but we paid for 25 meals, but you only had 18 kids. You have to do a point of service count. So again, the institution will bill you for the 25 breakfast, but you can only claim 18. And then this is an example of the menu or the contract meal delivery seat. Just the entity does, needs to make sure that they have a copy of these every single day because that is their menu of serve form. It tells us how much they gave you, how much food that you have, how much to serve out. And then if you do contract with a school district, just so people are aware, a school is required to charge a certain amount. It is regulated by USDA. So a school, if you contract with a school district, um, for your food, the school has to charge you the free reimbursement rate for breakfast, the free reimbursement rate for lunch, plus the value of commodities, plus an additional seven cents, and then they have to charge you the free rate for snack. And then if you are um, contracting with the school district, the contract is only good, is good from July 1st to June 30th. And um, we keep it on the school fiscal year, not the federal fiscal year. So you would wanna get a new contract every June. All right, we're on the downhill slide. Um, let's talk about the meal requirements. So meal requirements for at risk is meals must be served to all children for free. You cannot charge anybody for a meal. Um, schools receive commodities and they are allowed to use their commodities on this program. Meals must be eaten on site. Meals um, are served during the program time and children must be enrolled in an Even Start Head Start or a school to participate. It's an after school program. So it's only for school age kids. Again, you're only allowed to serve two, a maximum of two meals per day on at risk. One can be a main meal and one can be a snack. So it can be breakfast and snack or lunch and snack or supper and snack. You can't do breakfast and lunch or supper. Um, you can only do a snack and then one meal. School districts that are on the program. So we have what we call CACFP meal patterns, and then we have the National School Lunch Meal Patterns, and they are different. Um, I'm not really going to go into detail about that because we do a meal pattern, um, and I do, I'll do do it in two weeks. We do a CACFP meal pattern training, and it will also be in OSDE Connect after we're done with that. Um, but school districts are allowed to choose between the National School Lunch 
or you can do CACFP for at risk. You have a choice. You can't mix and match. You have to say, yes, we're doing CACFP or yes, we're doing the National School Lunch Program, but you can't do both together. You have to say, yes, we're doing this one or yes, we're doing this one, but you do have a choice. You can do CACFP or you can do the, lunch, the school lunch milk patterns. It's your choice. This is the National School Lunch Meal Patterns um, right here, as you can see. And then we also have the CACFP and they are again different. There are, the biggest thing that I would say is between CACFP and the National School Lunch is there are vegetable subgroups for National School Lunch, but with CACFP, you cannot serve sweet items like cookies, um, things like that. Sugar, there's a lot of sugar requirements for yogurt, for cereal, um, nothing sweet. Donuts, none of that can be served on CACFP. You are required to keep either production records or menu a serve form. A school district, you already do a production record. So we will just go ahead and tell you it doesn't matter if you're doing CACFP or the National School Lunch Meal Patterns. You can do a production record. You already know how to do the form. We like the form better anyway, so just continue to use the form that you're very familiar with. Nonprofits or daycare centers, this is the form that you'll use as the menu is serve form. Um, you write down everything as a whole that you serve for that day and you have to make sure that you write down the quantities. If you do not write down quantities, then we can take meals back. Now, something else, this is just an overview. So if you want, again, know, want to know more about the meal patterns, you go to CACFP meal pattern training. And the next one will be um, the second, it's always the second Tuesday of the month in the afternoon. So people ask us like, if, if I do CACFP meal patterns, um, what would you take back money for? And one is if you do not serve at least one whole grain item per day, schools, everything you serve has to be whole grain rich. If you serve juice more than once a day, so if you have snack and supper and you serve juice, both of those, then we would take back money. If you serve a lunch meat, that's not meat requirements. If you serve a grain-based dessert and a grain-based dessert are things like donuts and cookies and um, granola bars and Nutri-Green bars, those are considered grain-based desserts. If you did not serve enough food, if you don't have enough quantity that you gave them, if you serve food that's not found in the food buying guide, it also doesn't have a CN label or a product formulation statement. It means it's not allowable on CACFP. If you do not have a labels for whole grain rich foods, yogurt, cereal, or deli meats. If the quantities or components are not listed on the menu as serve form or the production record, or if you get your meals delivered to you, um, and you don't, if you don't have the meal delivery receipt, if we don't have a copy of that meal delivery receipt, then to us, you did not receive a meal that day. So this is just some additional information um, with at risk. This is stuff for COVID. Um, meals can be served on weekends, but you have to indicate this on your application. You still have to do the education and enrichment activity. It's still required. That's not been waived. There is a waiver if you're in an area that's less than 50% free and reduced. And if you do want to know more about that, then you can contact Cassie and you can, here's her email address. School, this is for school districts only. It doesn't matter if you're doing CACFP or the National School Lunch Program, the meal patterns, but schools are allowed to do offer versus serve. Um, you can do offer versus serve for lunch or supper. If you're doing grab and go because of COVID, you cannot do offer versus serve. But if you do offer versus serve, it's the same as it is with every meal pattern. You have to offer all five components and they only have to take three on the plate. Um, it is not allowed for snack. There's no such thing as um, they have, there's two components only for CACFP and they have to take them both. If you do need their originals or if you want blank copies, you can go here into the training manual and it's on page 161. Or you can go out to the resource library and look under worksheets or center forms and you're gonna find forms there. And that is it for today for At Risk.
Does anybody have any questions regarding at risk of anything that I went over with you? Well, I'm gonna stay on for just a few minutes. So if you do have any questions, I'm gonna put some music back on. Um, you can unmute if you'd like to ask any questions. Um, we are done with today's training. Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, but again, I'm gonna go ahead and put some music on. And if you do need anything, I'm gonna stick around for just a moment um, to answer any questions. And I hope you guys have a wonderful holiday and a wonderful Christmas break. I'm sure you guys are all looking forward to it. Um, and you guys have a wonderful time. Thank you.